们好。No one in the world today, anywhere in any other country, is more powerful than President Xi Jinping. He's declared himself chairman for life. I call him chairman of everything, chairman of everywhere, chairman of everyone. China's President Xi Jinping sees himself as a man of destiny. He commands a country on the cusp of becoming the biggest economy the world has ever seen, and he's building an army to defend it. No power can defeat our country's power. No power. 能够阻挡中国人民和中华民族的前进步伐。If you were to sum him up, what words come to mind? Messianic, um, ruthless. Really, very focused on control, right? He's very focused on control over the party, control over the country. We are turning more towards authoritarianism under Xi Jinping. He has centralized the power around him. To make China great again, Xi Jinping is upending the global balance of power. If any armed conflict breaks out between China and the United States, it will be catastrophe for mankind. It may become an Armageddon for humankind. Xi Jinping is a name that's become familiar to us all. This son of the communist revolution who rules his country by force. He dreams of reviving China's lost glory and overcoming a history of humiliation. The United States has named China its biggest strategic threat and Australia is caught in the crosshairs. Tonight, Four Corners asks, who is Xi Jinping? What drives him? And what does his rise mean for the world? Speaker, the President of the People's Republic of China. Madam Speaker, Mr. President, it is a joy to have friends come from afar. In 2014, Xi Jinping was on a charm offensive. He was in Canberra for the honour of addressing the joint houses of the Australian Parliament. China has always viewed Australia as an important partner. During my visit, the two sides have decided to elevate our bilateral relations into a comprehensive strategic partnership. As China grows, so does Australia grow. And why wouldn't you want to hitch yourself to that wagon? Uh, that, of, of course, was the time when we were, about the time when we were sealing the free trade agreement as well, uh, which was of great benefit to us, and we thought we could have it all. We could have a bountiful economic relationship and a steady political relationship. And, of course, that's not the case, and it won't be the case for a very long time. Our politicians were basking in the presence of a dictator who crushed dissent, jailed opponents, and led a nation accused of ethnic cleansing. But money talks. We had things to sell, and China is our biggest customer. Xi Jinping had his own agenda. We Chinese are striving to achieve the Chinese dream, which is the great renewal of the Chinese nation. The Chinese dream is about enhancing the strength and the prosperity of the nation and the well-being of the Chinese people. 
We were so naive and, you know, I put my own hand up for that as well. I was as naive as the next uh, parliamentarian. It was wishful thinking. We wanted China to be a, a, a kind of uh, a nation more like us. And more like us meant democratic. <laughs> Xi Jinping was at least mouthing the right words. We have set two goals for China's future development. The first is to double the 2010 GDP. The second is to turn China into a modern socialist country that is prosperous, democratic, culturally advanced and harmonious by the middle of the century. At a state dinner that night, Tony Abbott startled China watchers with a monumental misreading of what she really meant by democratic. I have never heard a Chinese leader declare that his country would be fully democratic by 2050. I have never heard a Chinese leader commit so explicitly to a rule-based international order founded on the principle that we should all treat others as we would be treated ourselves. I was there. I helped actually write a bit of Tony Abbott's formal speech response to Xi Jinping. Tony Abbott got up in particular at that, at that uh, banquet in the, the Great Hall and um, said he was so delighted because Xi Jinping had said by 2049 China would become um, a modern democratic society. And he was so delighted. Our ambassador to China was absolutely mortified by it. It's easy now for us to laugh at Tony Abbott when he referred to Xi Jinping as a proto-democrat, but Tony Abbott was by no means alone uh, when he made that statement. There are many statements that uh, political leaders have made about China, the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping that now look ridiculous. The world has changed and it's only fools and apologists who continue to, to defend Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. The darker aspects have always been there. Ever since the establishment of People's Republic of China, China was never democratic. So with the elevation of Xi Jinping, that hasn't changed. Xi and his wife traveled to Tasmania, where they were met like royalty. We knew that if we could get the president of China to visit Tasmania, it would put Tasmania onto the map within China, that the Chinese people watch every step of their leader and they follow what he says to do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You speak Chinese very good. Thank you. Yes, they have a different value system to us, but part of what life is is trying to get to know other people and what makes them tick and how we can work together to make the world a better place. And one way you make the world a better place is through trade. With Tony Abbott in tow, Xi met politicians and business leaders. It was all about what Xi could do for the Apple Isle. Increasing trade and investment opportunities between China and Tasmania. Over the next five years, Tasmania's business with China would boom, topping a billion dollars a year. Tasmania is really a remarkable case study, and I've spent quite a bit of time uh, down there and uh, working with people who are very concerned about it. In Tasmania, there's been a downside that certainly many Tasmanians have become alarmed about. For example, the huge amount of investment funds flowing in from China to buy up prime agricultural land, horticulture, dairy operations, and people are starting to think, well, is it really in our interest to have our best uh, primary resources owned by Chinese companies? It was all smiles as Xi Jinping left Australia. Our leaders were happy with the free trade agreement and the Chinese president had his eyes on the long game, extending China's influence 
and building its power. I think China has been on a sort of mostly a single track, but you know, it takes opportunities where it can. With Australia, I think Australia is important as a US ally. It's important as a US intelligence partner. Uh, it's important as a big diplomatic uh, player in the Asia Pacific or the Indo Pacific, if you like. And in that respect, it was worth putting time into Australia, uh, perhaps to, perhaps to neutralise it uh, as a US ally in the region. I mean, that's the long game uh, in that respect. It's about China being the most dominant country in the region. Xi Jinping was born into a country of war and revolution on June 15, 1953. His father was a Communist Party hero, a right-hand man of Mao Zedong. Xi is party royalty, what is in China called a princeling, but as he prefers, a man of the people. When he was a boy, his country was starving. The Great Famine that began in the late 1950s is estimated to have killed more than 30 million people. By his teens, China was in the grip of the Cultural Revolution as Mao set loose his red guards to drive out his enemies. Xi's father was purged, something Xi would not forget. And he's the person for the Cultural Revolution in 1966 when it started in China, and so basically he was on his own. I think his father was put under house arrest a few years before, and so he was really kind of left as almost like a political orphan. And I think that generation, you know, for the next few years, it really made them very tough in a way, very resilient and self, you know, kind of uh, uh, self-supporting. 16-year-old Xi Jinping was one of a generation of urban Chinese youth now banished to live among the rural poor. Xi was sent to Shanxi province in northwest China. When he initially went out to the countryside, he was scared frightened, to use a Western vernacular, uh, freaked out by what was happening. In other words, his political family was under threat and in fact were being marginalised. So it both hardened him, it also gave him a real sense of the ups and downs of power. And I think that's one reason why he's so ruthless himself. He lived in a dusty village not far from the city of Yan'an, where decades earlier, Mao Zedong led his supporters on the fabled Long March during the Civil War against the American-backed nationalists. These were formative years for Xi in the heartland of the Communist Revolution. He could have rejected the party, but in fact he embraced it even more. I think it is, would be very difficult for anyone at the time to reject the party. And I can see why for someone who has suffered under the Cultural Revolution, they might actually want to embrace the party even more. Really? That even though he and his family suffered, he would want to embrace the party even more? Yes, it is a quite common experience amongst people in China that you want your suffering to mean something. This is where Xi Jinping built his myth, sleeping in a cave carved from the hillside and working alongside peasant farmers, a story he's promoted time and again. So he actually was re-educated just as Mao wanted. 
just as Mao wanted. He wanted to re-educate China's young people in the 1960s. Most people think the Cultural Revolution was merely a power struggle and a purge. Yes, it was, but it was also more. It was about Mao trying to train up a generation of younger people who would, in the end, be party ideologues and supporters who would help maintain the ethos of party control and the revolution far beyond his day. Like Mao, Xi saw China's peasant farmers as his pathway to power. He calls himself a son of Yellow Earth. This Yellow Earth mythology fed into the party's belief that our true origins are in the countryside, are with eternal China's past. Xi Jinping, I think, always sort of talks as though he's really connected to the kind of people who live in the rural areas and they're not forgotten. He's a populist in that sense. He's really trying to show that he is, you know, kind of the, uh, like a kind of a, a, an earthly emperor. Mao died in 1976, ending the Cultural Revolution. Xi's father was rehabilitated and helped his ambitious son with party connections. Marriage to a famous singer who performed with the People's Liberation Army boosted his popularity. Xi worked his way through the ranks, becoming governor of Fujian province. He was seen by party power brokers as a safe option. Loyal to the party, uncontroversial, straight-faced and stoic. In 2008, he was made vice president. Xi was the heir apparent. And by the way, he was the first Chinese leader uh, since 1979, 1980, who had not been chosen by Deng Xiaoping. So it was quite a big deal. Xi Jinping was elected president in 2012, forming the next great link in the chain after Chairman Mao and the man who kick-started China's economic revolution, Deng Xiaoping. There's a saying in China that Mao made the country one, Deng made the country rich, Xi is making the country strong. This is the third revolution, as it were. Certainly, I think he would be attracted to that view himself because it gives him great agency. It makes him, you know, a figure of uh, a history, of historical change, an agent of history. And I think certainly he sees himself like that. Xi Jinping revealed his vision for China, what he called the China dream. What Mao started, he would finish. The final stage of the revolution, to return China to the apex of global power. On the national level, China dream means the uh, revitalization of China. After all, China was humiliated for more than 100 years, ever since the first Opium War, and China need to rise up. And this is a continuous process. China by today is already the second largest economy in the world. And in less than 10 years time, China will be the largest economy in the world. And China need to project its own image onto the world as a force for peace and stability and economic development. When we first heard China Dream, a lot of us thought it was going to be a lot like the American Dream, which is basically a very individualist vision of having uh, a lot of material prosperity, uh, a lot of freedom to do what you want, um, and living as a citizen in, in a powerful state, but one that doesn't intrude too much. So that was the American Dream. And the China Dream, I think people initially thought that that was being offered. But it's become very clear that what she means by a China Dream is really a state a Chinese state dream. It's not an individual dream. It's not a dream for citizens. It's a vision of a state, a Chinese state that's very strong, uh, that's internationally respected, uh, that can throw its weight around internationally if it needs to, um, and that is in no way inferior to anybody else. 
As president, Xi Jinping moved quickly to consolidate his hold on the party and the country. The moment he came into power, it was pedal to the metal, if you like. He accelerated on all fronts to eliminate dissent, to eliminate rivals, to eliminate corruption. Now, his family had been involved in lots of deals as well. That's been well documented. There was nothing that made Chinese people more angry than seeing officials around them, be it in a township, city, province, wherever, uh, high on the hog, getting rich, and frankly, getting rich uh, in very nefarious ways. Um, you know, stealing farmers' land, getting cuts of deals, uh, you know, promoting their relatives, uh, et cetera, et cetera. China was very corrupt. It probably still is, not like it was. And so Xi Jinping used the anti-corruption campaign both as a populist measure and to purge his rivals. Xi widened the net, locking up dissidents, lawyers, writers and artists. I remember back when Xi Jinping was first elevated as a leader, there was actually quite a lot of expectation placed on Xi Jinping. We are seeing a turning more towards authoritarianism under Xi Jinping. Um, he has centralised the power around him. And also, we're also seeing that there is increased concerns about human rights in China as well. Um, in Hong Kong, with regards to pro-democracy activists and legislators and in Xinjiang with regards to what the Chinese government has been doing to Uyghurs and other ethnic minority groups. What we didn't see, except for a very small handful of close observers, is that Xi Jinping wasn't the great liberator. He wasn't going to be the man who would continue the liberalising trend. In fact, he was exactly the opposite. He was a return in a very decisive way to the oppressive Leninist party control freakery that we had uh, so feared. And it's only now, as some of the more insightful and long-standing China analysts have started to uh, expose what Xi Jinping was saying way back at the end of 2012 and in 2013, they were starting to say, oh, we were just so wrong about this man. Xi Jinping has relentlessly crafted his own cult of personality. Chinese audiences are fed a constant diet of propaganda on state-run media about Xi and his China dream. Through his firm resolve, charisma and intelligence, he's brought the world closer to China. Worldwide, there's now a better understanding of China as a major country. This new historical course charted by President Xi Jinping is the fundamental direction of Chinese diplomacy in the new era. The cult of Xi is everywhere in the media. There's Xi, the beaming father of the nation. And she, the man of the common people. <laughs> With long memories of the brutal Mao years, some in the party have grown nervous. One of the things that the party elders have admonished him for at different times is the personality cult, because for them it's too much like Mao. It's too much like a single capricious ruler who is everywhere. But she seems to um, think it works. And this is another reason, I think, why he sort of values Mao, because whether you think he got things done well or badly, the only way to get things done uh, is to be a dictator in China. In 2018, Xi made a dramatic power grab that shocked China and the world. He would now effectively be president for life. 
I think that came as a, quite a surprise to many people because the presidential term limit was set precisely because Mao Zedong's rule that those mistakes will not happen again. But then it was removed, seemingly paving way for one person to have a lot of power around himself, which means that potentially that could create a problem for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so that is a problem the Chinese Communist Party obviously recognised itself before. Um, but now it has been completely removed and it is, I think, quite shocking to a lot of people even inside China as well. President Xi Jinping is now the paramount leader of China. He's the president of the People's Republic of China. He's the general secretary of the Communist Party of China and he's the chairman of the Central Military Commission. So he's vested with the most important powers for China as a government leader, military leader and party leader. He's declared himself chairman for life. I call him chairman of everything, chairman of everywhere, chairman of everyone. The president for life enshrined his name and doctrine in the constitution. Xi Jinping thought became the guidebook to propel the country into its new era. I think Xi Jinping thought says that the party rules all and that China is on a path to inevitable greatness and that everybody better get used to that. Universities run compulsory courses in Xi Jinping thought. Saturation media coverage even includes a TV show where contestants are quizzed on their knowledge of Xi's life and thought. How far is Xi Jinping prepared to go? He's now president for life. What will he do to achieve what he wants for his country? Well, the mission is to create a powerful, strong China. So 2021 is the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party, so we'll see a bit more of this vision. The problem for Xi Jinping is that domestically, nationalism works. You know, his nationalistic message of a strong, powerful China is something that I think almost all Chinese sign up to. But externally, it doesn't look good. I mean, this is something that scares people. They look at this and think, wow, what is this bellicose-sounding nationalistic country that's so big and so unknown? So this is going to be a big, big challenge that's going to need pretty good diplomacy. At home, Xi knows that poverty eradication among China's 1.4 billion strong population is critical to keeping the party in power. That's the deal, that the Chinese people will sacrifice freedom for wealth. So far, it has worked. The reality is that Xi Jinping and his colleagues believe themselves as the agents of history and a history that is about making China one of the great powers that is also a prosperous, stable society that will contribute to humanity as a whole. And if in that process, a few individuals must be crushed or silenced, a few dissidents must be thrown into jail. A few national minorities in Tibet and Xinjiang and their religious aberrant religious beliefs must be corralled, contained and reformed. Well, that's simply the price that the great collective of the Chinese people, which I, Xi Jinping and my colleagues represent, that's just the price they all have to pay. And it's for their good. Because after all, I am a, a patriarchal leader and I know what's best for all of you. The creation myth of Xi Jinping draws tourists from across the country who travel to the village where he spent seven long years in exile. 
Everything here is a shrine to see and all he represents. Posters of Mao Zedong hang in the cave where Si slept. Marxist texts and books which influenced him are on display. Party publications documenting his rise through the provinces are for sale. Locals sing his praises. Uh the nearby city of Yan'an, critical to the sea myth, is a must-see for revolutionary tourists. Guest house manager Li Ming makes his living from party mythology, dressing up in the uniform worn by Mao's troops. I think the Communist Party of China with almost 100 million members are fully behind him and the Chinese nation of 1.4 billion Chinese people are also rallying behind President Xi Jinping in domestic economic development as well as on the international stage. Victor Gao is a party insider who has been as close as possible to power. As official translator, he was trusted by the man who ignited China's economic revolution, Deng Xiaoping. He now works for a pro-government think tank. I would say, by my personal uh, calculation, no one in the world today anywhere in any other country is more powerful than President Xi Jinping in terms of the country he is leading, in terms of the level of responsibilities he is exercising, in terms of his level of responsibility for the job he is doing, taking care of the welfare and the well-being of the Chinese nation, but also contributing to peace and development and also fighting against all kinds of false accusations and distortions mostly created by Washington in terms of the rise of China. Under the guidance of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, the PLA has thoroughly implemented Xi Jinping thought on strengthening the military. Xi Jinping is building a military as powerful as his economic might. Officially, he spends around $250 billion a year on defence. Others estimate the real figure may be double that. Images of his battle-ready troops are pumped out for international and domestic consumption. Certainly in China, this sense of nationalism has channeled this sense of resentment and this sense of past humiliation, um, which funnels a sort of aggressive nationalism. China is a meteoric rising power. The US is a colossal ruling power. And when a rising power is displacing or threatening to displace a ruling power from its position 
at the top of every pecking order. Uh, basically, things get worse and then they get worse. To the US, Xi Jinping's China is its biggest strategic threat. As long as China continues achieving or trying to achieve the China dream uh, that Xi Jinping has laid out quite vividly, and as long as the U.S. Uh, attempts to maintain the position it's enjoyed for an American century as the leading power in the world and as the architect of a very successful international order, there's going to be a a grand contest, uh, and it will discombobulate everything from American politics, as we've seen here, to international relations. As an American ally, Australia is caught between its economic interests and its security. As far as China is concerned, Australia has been even more agitated than Washington in many situations. And from the Chinese perspective, what the Australian government has been doing over the past several years has been very much demonstrating hostility against China as a country, against the Chinese people, and against the Chinese political system. Xi Jinping has made it clear on his watch Australia needs to mind its step. In less than 10 years time, China will be larger than the United States as an economy. And by the middle of the century, the size of the Chinese economy is expected to, to be double the size of the United States. That gives more opportunity for countries like Australia to engage with China on a peaceful basis and to do more business with China rather than, for example, blindly, without exercising your own judgment and your own brain, for example, to refuse to see the bigger trend coming and refuse to embrace the rise of China as an opportunity, but really doing the suicidal thing to cut off yourself from China, from the Chinese nation and from the Chinese market. Xi has drawn battle lines across the region. Chinese and Indian troops clashed on their border last year with casualties on both sides. For Xi Jinping, it was a propaganda coup. Then there is the South China Sea where the U.S. and China stare each other down. Foreign military aircraft, this is Chinese Navy. You are approaching our military alert zone. Leave immediately in order to avoid misjudgment. I am a United States military aircraft conducting lawful military activities outside national airspace. Xi Jinping has ignored international court rulings and built military installations on disputed islands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine vehicles moving. China in the Indo-Pacific is a reality. For the US being here, it's a choice. China knows that, and over time, I think China wants to make the price the US pays for that to go up. And in many respects, I think China is a much more predictable player here. You know, China wants to dominate the region, uh, China wants to be the most powerful country in the region. Uh, China wants its military to be their sort of, you know, biggest in the region and the like. That's just obvious. Any country would want to do that of China's size, be, be it a communist party or a dictate, you know, a, d a democracy. In Hong Kong, Xi has shown the world how ruthless he can be. He has crushed protest and introduced new laws putting a stranglehold on the former British territory. Hong Kong stands as a warning to Taiwan. Absolutely central to Chinese modernization, Xi Jinping's program is restoring China's territorial integrity. 
this is a big deal. That means Taiwan comes back. And if you think about it, uh, regaining control of Taiwan, a self-governing island of about 25 million people, a very modern society, most importantly democratic, which does not think of itself as part of the People's Republic of China, um, which has run itself for, you know, 70, 80 years, which has had an independent streak since the 19th century. China says we're going to control that, and I think she wants to do it on his watch. And Xi declares he will regain Taiwan, even if it means war. China has ramped up threatening military exercises near Taiwan. If Xi attacks Taiwan, he could trigger a war with the United States, potentially dragging in Australia. I think if there were a war, it would be insane. I think you couldn't be confident that if a war developed over Taiwan, and even if it began as a small war, that it could expand into a larger war, and that once you get up the escalation ladder in a larger war, that even nuclear weapons might become, uh, you know, part of the uh, part of the conflict. If any armed conflict breaks out between China and the United States, it will be a catastrophe for mankind. It may become an Armageddon for humankind. For Western democracies, the battle lines are already drawn. Can we live in a world where the dominant economic power and all of the other power that comes with that is one that fundamentally rejects the values of our society. Well, we can live in that world, but it's going to be a much less comfortable world, and it's going to be one in which um, we'll have, you know, terms dictated to us more than we have um, them dictated to us now. Now, that doesn't mean China gets its way, but it means that China is much more difficult to deal with and might get its way on a lot of things. So, yeah, life's going to get harder for us. If all you're doing is sitting around and feeling upset or fearful or angry that China is bigger and more powerful, then you've put us on a very dangerous spiral, I feel. And that's something that worries me, not only as an observer, but also as a, as a citizen um, of the United States and also as a person, you know, who wants, doesn't want the world to go to hell. Everything in Xi Jinping's life has led him to this point. He rules his country like an emperor. His China dream is within reach. And he's warning the West, if they try to stop him, they'll pay. Some days I think the battle is over and China's influence is now so great. And Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party are so determined to become the dominant hegemon in the world that there's nothing we can do. But really, we can't give up like that. I mean, when you think of what's at stake, when you think of the freedoms that we on a daily basis take for granted and enjoy, Now we're dealing with this radically different view of the world, which is not a modern one. I mean, it's not like China is a power that sprung from nowhere. It's got historic roots going back many, many centuries. This is not something that can be just shifted. This history we're moving into, this world we're moving into, there is no roadmap. There is no easy roadmap.